Hey guys, welcome back. Morning. Morning. I'm Chris Kajani. And I'm Eric Goodmanson. And we make the wine at Machine Vineyards and we're here in Dr. G's barn. So you can kind of take a look around here. The tractor, nice old barn. First apartment for rent, if anybody's looking. <laughs> uh, for those of you that uh, are in our wine club, you may have been here because we do a G blending trial every year in this barn where we take uh, current vintage and graduated cylinders and people hang out and try and put together a blend that's as close to ours yeah. um, as possible and whoever does it wins wine. So uh, we hope to do that again um, sometime later this year. So keep an eye out for that. But today we're here to talk about uh, this beautiful vineyard. Look at this. Gorgeous out here today. There's Bouchain. So there's Bouchain out there in our terraces. And then Dr. G's vineyard, <clears throat> depending on who you talk to, was uh, planted in 81, 84. Um, we're the only people that have gotten fruit from Dr. G's vineyard. I guess he just walked over to Bouchain back in the day when it first uh, when it first came online and said, hey, I planted this Pinot Noir, would you like it? And so we started buying it and have bought it ever since and made a G Vineyard Pinot Noir forever and ever and ever, and it's wonderful. But we wanted to talk about the vines because they're really special, so let me flip it around. When we talk about head-trained vines, Eric, what exactly are we talking about? All right, so get a little clearer picture here. I'm gonna kick down some of this cover crop. So here is one of Dr. G's beautiful Pinot Noir vines, the St. Clair clone. And unlike what we saw last week over in our vineyard, which is just a, a short hop away, our vine, the main structure comes up. And then from there, we've either got, we've got two options really. We have two arms that come out that are permanent, which is the cordon. We've got a few vines over here that are actually cordon. We'll talk about that in a minute. Otherwise, we've got one-year-old shoots that come off, which are canes. Whereas this, you come up and this gnarly sort of head here has arms that are permanent structures and you've got your buds coming off these different placements throughout, but it's, um, it's all kind of centralized in this one head area. And so from here, um, we, he, Dr. G has some structure here. We've got this one wire on some redwood stakes, <clears throat> but it's, it's really not a lot of structure within the whole vineyard. And that's part of its beauty because now from this head, we've got, we do have some, some shoots here and buds along that, and that'll send off shoots of, with, with fruit on it. Um, but it, it's, as Chris says, it's a Pinot bad hair day. It just kind of flops all over the place. And it's not positioned up into wires like we have in our vineyard, which makes it real easy for canopy manipulation and picking and everything like that. Instead here, to even get sprays in, you have to be careful because that canopy is everywhere. If you need to get into the fruit zone, um, you have to be more deliberate and careful and when you're picking or doing any other work in this canopy It's a lot more work in general. And so It's not as simple as what's called our VSP a vertical shoot position where everything is in a nice pretty row instead. It's just insanity <laughs> and, uh, uh, Controlled chaos to a degree definitely it's controlled chaos pick, um, but it's got a beauty to it and um, it's very much more old school in general. So you can see these old parts of the vine that then these small little two bud uh, spurs are coming off of. And then each of these will be a shoot. And then each of those shoots will have a couple, um, a couple clusters on them. Oh, and we have cluster primordia starting here. But for those of you, oh, and here's another one. Those are tiny, tiny, tiny little clusters. 
For those of you that saw the picture on Facebook announcing this Facebook Live today, that's what the G Vineyard looks like during harvest. So when we talk about a bad hair day, that's what we're talking about, where basically I think the picture I took was from right about here, showing our vineyard in the terrace with the G Vineyard in the forefront. And you saw shoots just going all over the place and just crazy shoots going everywhere, leaves going everywhere. You couldn't even really see what it is. Um, that's what G Vineyard looks like right before we harvest it. It, uh, it's definitely a Pinot Noir bad hair day, um, but without trellising, without dry farming, these beautiful old vines, when you taste the grapes, the concentration is just bananas. And it's not just the concentration of fruit, but it's all the crazy, like mushroomy, chanterelle, uh, Eric calls it black earth. Um, just this beautiful, savory, uh, umami almost flavor. Really, really neat. Hey, need me some of that G Vineyard Pinot. Thanks, Ian, I'm so glad you like it. Um, we're gonna release in May the uh, 2018. So get ready for that, that's coming. Um, but for now, let's talk a little bit more about what's happening here. Eric, what would you say that dry farming is adding to the site? So dry farming, um, so going back to the beginning of it all, so Dr. G and his family literally hand planted all of these vines. <clears throat> and what they did for the first couple of years is they came out with you know, buckets of water, a tractor with a, a small tank on it, and hand watered all these individual vines. And so even a young vine needs some additional water that Mother Nature is not going to provide in a rainy season. Uh, after that, though, the vine is on its own. And it, it's not established with a drip irrigation system in it, and so it's not on the drip. It doesn't expect that. And so what the vines have to do is send their shoots down deep and it searches out for its own water source. It comes through, there's a couple things. And so the rainy season will provide the water that it needs, but it also is gonna seek out water down below. And so depending on how deep the soil is, those vines can send roots down as far as, as is needed. If you've got a really uh, vigorous, or a, a, a really deep soil, vines can shoot their roots down 40, 50 feet. Here that's not going to be possible because in Carneros, one of the things our soil profile is sort of known for is its clay content. And so here my guess is that six feet down you're going to hit a clay hard pan. And those vines can shoot roots down into that, but it takes decades to penetrate, which they've probably done by now. But a lot of this root structure is in the, that six feet, and so it's searching all, all for water. Um, and so they came out, they watered those first couple years. After that, they were on its own. Mother Nature gives it its, um, you know, soil content or uh, moisture content for the year. It sets it up via the, the rainy season. And what they can also do to help that is all this cover crop that we see in here now. Um, is is going to get mowed down, disked in, tilled in, tilled under, and what they're going to do is create more of what's typically referred to, or sometimes referred to as a dull, dust mulch layer. And so they're going to they're going to they're going to do a lot more manipulation to this soil uh, with a tractor than what we'll do over in our vineyard. We, we're trying not to, to till as much, not to do as much uh, soil compaction, but. What Dr. G, G does here is they're going to do more of that tilling and mowing to get all this stuff down because this is where a lot of the nitrogen content is going to come from is this soil or this uh, cover crop in here. These are really pretty sweet peas yeah. all throughout here. <clears throat> and so then they will break all this down, till it in, and what they're going to do is essentially try to trap in as much moisture as possible with that dust mulch layer because when you we create that sort of puffy dust layer. Uh, it's it's breaking off all the avenues for the uh, vap or the moisture to to reach the the sky, and so it's stopping that evaporation with that layer. And so we're trying to trap that in there with this layer. And um, so dry farming, then you're going to get less crop because well, that's just we've got 
vine age playing a role here. As vines get older, they're not going to produce as much typically. Speaking of that, Sheena asked real quick, um, you know, about do vines get better with age? How long can they stay planted and be viable? Oh, well, if they're taken care of properly, you can have centuries old vineyards really here in Napa. People tend to uh, replant 25 every 25 or 30 years just because of the amount of disease and virus that we see in vineyards these days. Um, but these are almost 40 year old vines and they're still going strong. There's certain areas uh, in this vineyard where there's no fruit on some of the vines, but uh, for the most part, it still produces a, a decent sized crop. There's variability year after year, but um, we still will get uh, anywhere from one and a half to I don't know two, maybe two and a half tons per acre on a, on a better year for this vineyard, which is smaller than what we can get on our vineyard. We have areas within our vineyard where if we let the vine do what it wanted, it would probably produce six tons an acre, but we temper that back a little bit. And so our average is going to be more like three or three and a half tons per acre. Here it's going to be less. The vine age plays a part and not having irrigation is also going to play a part. So you get smaller clusters, smaller berries, that juice to skin ratio is off compared to ours. And so you've got less juice, more skin, which produces real intense flavors. And so all those factors are playing a part a lot of it set up by the fact that this is a dry farm vineyard. Um, the spacing of this, all, I mean, you could drive a car down these roads. These are really, really wide. Yeah, let's talk about spacing real quick. So um, when you look in the distance, way over there at our vineyard, most of that is on a six by eight foot spacing and some is on a seven by four foot spacing. If you look here, these old vines, are six to eight feet apart and then in between the row that's got to be 12 feet. Yeah. One thing you do see is you see some of these interplants. So this is a young vine here, old vine, young vine. So part of this vineyard has been interplanted and with interplanting um, you're bringing young vines in that can produce a little bit more fruit, make it a little bit more viable because like Eric was saying, tons per acre is both the spacing and exactly how you're cropping the vine. And for us, when we're uh, um, sampling this vineyard during the growing season, what happens is you walk along and you look at this vine and there'll be nothing. And then you walk along and you look at this vine and there could be nothing. And you walk along and you look at this vine and there's 20 pounds of fruit on the vine. So it's pretty variable being an older vineyard um, and the spacing being so big, the tons per acre, you know, if we get two tons per acre, we're doing really, really well. Um, a lot of times, like Eric was saying, it's like one and a half ish, um, even down to one in a really tight, in a tight dry year. So Dr. G came in and did a little bit of interplanting um, and we do sample those different. And so you, during the growing season can go through um, and sample those young vines and kind of see where they are as far as uh, sugars and acids and get a feel for flavor. Uh, also get a feel for how the vines are hanging out um, with whatever uh, weather Mother Nature is throwing at us. So if it's a really dry year um, and we are dry farmed here, uh, what do those vines look like? Is there a lot of heat stress? Um, are they going to be able to hang out during any additional heat stress? So we're looking at that. Uh, the old vines, quite frankly, don't care. <laughs> so we go through occasionally like a five day heat spike. 2017 we had a pretty big heat spike after uh, Labor Day and the old vines just don't care. Number one, this vine is going to look absolutely bananas as the shoots grow. So as these grow, they're going to come out, a lot of them, four to six feet, even touching the ground all over the place occasionally. And so as that happens, a lot of fruit is underneath those leaves and underneath kind of like layers of shoots. Uh, and that fruit's pretty protected from the sun. Hey, um, Alex is asking, lots of birds in the background. Uh, although music to the ears, do they cause a challenge when the grapes get ripe? Very much yeah. so, yes. Yeah, good one. The birds are our biggest uh, problem, really, in our vineyards at Bouchane. A vineyard manager will say that a, a vineyard's biggest pest is actually a winemaker. Um, <laughs> but behind that, birds are the biggest pest for us. And so 
Um, we have bird netting. We also use a falconer, which many of, many of you have heard about. And so we have different tools at our uh, disposal that we're fight, uh, fighting those birds with. But over here, Dr. G does not have any of those things. And so we, um, I think the way the canopy is sort of set up with this sort of sporadic nature, it makes it easier for those birds to kind of get in there as well. But there's certainly bird damage over here, but it's not as, uh, not as robust that we've seen over in our vineyard. And so I'm not sure necessarily why that is, but... I think the fruit's a little more hidden. Yeah, I think just the fruit being underneath and just not as accessible is probably playing the biggest part, is my guess. But uh, over here, it's not as big a deal. It certainly is a problem, and with that much damaged fruit, if it were to be bad in a, in a heavier bird damage year, we would have to cull that out for sure. The people that are picking these vineyards, and these are picked by hand by an amazing crew of people, they come in and they pick it by hand, and they know if they see a lot of bird damage on the fruit, they're not going to pick that. Um, some of that will make it in. We've used an optical sorter last year on the fruit, and so that gets kicked out. Um, but if, if you were to have a lot of bird damaged fruit make it into a fermentation, that can cause problems. There's bacterial infections that can happen. It affects the fermentation rate and overall you know, viability of finishing the fermentation. So we certainly don't want any of that bird damaged fruit in there. Um, and then during the season, um, as you go through and you see bird damage, sometimes they're literally just pecking on the on the grape. They're not um, they're not very well mannered, and so they're not just going to eat the grape, which would be fine if they did that. They don't do that. They just get in there and peck. And when they do that, then juice starts dripping down the berry and into the cluster. And at that point, now you've got sugar. And once you have sugar, all kinds of stuff can grow on it. Um, and so you'll see when you have significant bird damage, a lot of times you'll pop up with a lot of uh, a lot of mold pressure, um, which makes it easy to pick those clusters out and not actually put them in your fermentation as you sort them, but it's really frustrating to watch. In fact, in areas that have really high bird damage, which are normally like underneath um, telephone wires, you guys have seen all the birds just sit up on the telephone wire. Well, if that wire is over a vineyard and they just come down and have a tasty snack all day long, and then we have to go through and, and typically thin it before we even harvest it. And so we'll go through and we'll drop all that bird damage like the day before we harvest just to make sure that that doesn't get in. All right, what if we look at this head train vine again sure. and then walk over and look at something that is a spur pruned cordon. So this guy's head trained and they've laid some canes out on this one. Let's walk over here and check out something that's a cordon. I'm gonna film it so the sun's behind me. All right. Yeah, so this got interplanted. This is not a very young, well, I mean, it's a younger vine than, than this guy for sure. This is close to 40 years old. This one, it probably got interplanted. Mm, 10 years ago, maybe? Yeah, between five and 10 years ago. And, um, and so this is that um, more traditional, at least these days, looking vine than what we'll see in, in a lot of growing areas. And so we've got the trunk coming up and then we had two canes get laid out and they stayed permanently. And so then all these positions are where the buds originally popped up and they've become this spur position. And so now this has got a lot of sort of extra buds on here. And what we'll do, they've left three here. Well, there's four actually, we can get rid of that. We don't need that much. And so these two shoots and this one as well, we'll have three positions here. At some point, um, they can come through and, and thin it if need be, but we've already got cluster primordia here. So these are future clusters already. And so from each of the, this one position, there's gonna be two shoots and that'll have four clusters right there. If we allow this third one to grow, we would have six clusters at this one position, which can be a lot, but um, uh, it kind of depends individually on vines if they've got the ability to, to carry that much fruit or if they're too weak. Sometimes these shoots will be 
you know, the size of my pinky or the thickness of the pinky at least. Like this, that's a nice size shoot. If it's too thin, um, that more like a pencil, we would only, you know, something like this, you know, I'd probably just want that one on there. Um, or if they're really thick, they can have more, they've got more capacity to grow more fruit. But this is a nice difference between this head trained and then the, the, the cordon trained, spur pruned. It looks gnarly, but it, it truly is a beautiful vineyard out here. And especially on today when the sun is shining, it's going to be beautiful. I know, all this fog is breaking up now. Crazy. So pretty today. This was the first place that I came with Chris when I first started at Bussein in July of 2015. And I had come from a vineyard where every shoot was perfectly manicured. Like every shoot, every cluster was touched by a human hand multiple times throughout the season. Chris brought me over here and I thought, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> it was, it's messy. I, it was, it's messy and you know, viticulture <laughs> can be messy sometimes, but then we were bottling the 2014 vintage in, it was in tank, it was going to get bottled. We came over to the tank and tasted it and recognized that the fruit just has this amazing purity and individuality to it. And so, um, I had to change my thinking and stop being such a Napa Valley snob when it came to viticulture and winemaking. Such and, a diva. Uh, such a diva. That's my nickname here, <laughs> Eric the Diva. Um, that's not true. Don't call me that, people. <laughs> um, but it, it has such a beauty to it, and it's, um, it's a rarity in Napa, in California, all over really the world to see vineyards like this still existing. And so we feel really grateful to Dr. G that we're able to purchase this fruit, work with him on the viticulture side of it all. And uh, it's, it's just... Year after year, it's one of our favorites to blend and to drink vintage after vintage. It's truly a, a great wine. And you know, we look forward to having more of these barn parties in the future. Because That's right. Dr. G comes to him. He's always got a smile on his face. and We will be up in that barn doing a G blending party, hopefully soon. For those of you that have been before, and I see that Mike is watching. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Um, it's a super fun time and uh, we'll shoot an email out. We can put it on Facebook too at some point uh, and invite everybody because uh, Dr. G comes out and does a vineyard tour himself. We walk through and, and you're literally tasting wines from our cellar that have not been blended yet. Um, trying to, to hook up a blend just like we would. Graduated cylinders and all, pipettes, the whole shebang. Uh, it's pretty fun. It is fun. Very it's fun. pretty fun. So let's walk down this row real quick before we go. Last, uh, Last time we did this, we talked about um, variability of bud break, different lengths of shoots, and we're walking down this old vine vineyard that's interplanted, and quite frankly, it looks more even than some of the blocks that we have going on at our place. So this guy is a little behind. You can see these buds here. A little bit of a little bit of action there, but mostly buds that are just kind of uh, waiting to pop. But in general, what Eric and I look for walking around is how even bud break is looking, and making sure there's no real pest pressure, which so far so good this year. Um, we will start taking a look through. Uh, Taking a look at mowing, this is a time of year we have had some uh, frost um, frost fans on and not much frost damage, but getting those frost fans on, mixing what they call an inversion layer so that frost doesn't actually settle down on a vineyard. And the issue with cover crop is the frost will actually settle right around the top of this cover crop. So if the top of the cover crop is right at the height of where your new shoots are and you have a frost event, you're going to basically kill those, uh, those new shoots. So 2008 was a pretty serious frost here. We've had little pockets of it since, um, but it's definitely something that we, we keep an eye on. Yeah, we don't need any more 
issues this year. No, no more <laughs> issues. We're kind of, we're done with all the issues of 2020. We just want to bring you guys some great 2020 vintage and uh, move on in a healthy and safe and uh, connected way. We definitely want to mention that we miss you all. It's very quiet at the winery right now. Very quiet. And uh, we've been thinking about you. We miss you. We really appreciate you tuning in to our, um, our Facebook Live posts and want to also let you know that uh, if you reach out to our office, uh, we have some guest chefs that are going to come cook in our new kitchen. Uh, noon this Thursday, Don Giovanni, which is uh, just a signature restaurant in Napa, been around over 30 years. Uh, they'll be in our kitchen. And who else do we have coming up? We have, uh, we have more people. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely sign up for our list because the e-blast e will go out with the schedule. Um, but speaking of noon, the other thing that's happening this week is tomorrow and Wednesday, um, through our actual virtual tasting system, uh, Eric and I are going to sit down and taste the, the new club shipment. So we're just going to taste wine. We're going to open it all up. We'll answer questions. Um, you don't have to open all yours up, uh, but if you wanted to, we're going to do the whole shebang. So we're going to do it on Tuesday and again on Wednesday at noon. Um, but that, again, is through our virtual system. So you need to contact our office. Um, and get signed up for that. Uh, and email blast will go out, kind of describing uh, all the different wines that we're gonna taste and, and what we're gonna go over. Um, so anyway, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for staying connected with us. Um, we're really glad that you enjoy the wines and we appreciate your support and we're definitely thinking of you guys and sending a big hug out to everybody. All right, see you soon, bye. bye.